So let's open our Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 9. If you're new to Coastline or to Calvary Chapel Churches, we really make it our rhythm on Sunday mornings to read and to study and to learn the Bible so that we can live God's Word. So for the next 40, 60, 80 minutes, however long God's going to have us together these next few moments, we're going to be in God's Word together, going verse by verse through this book, through this chapter. So this morning, our heart and our hope is to be in the first 13 verses of Mark chapter 9. And here's what I'd like to do this morning as we consider this text. I'd like to read it in its entirety. Verses 1 through 13, I'm going to be reading and teaching this morning from the New Living Translation, more of a a thought-for-thought translation of God's Word. And then I'd like to just dive into the text bit by bit. And this morning, together, learn more about who Jesus is. That's what this text will share and show to us, more of who He truly is. And I believe how our lives can look in light of who Jesus is. So let's jump in. Let let me read through the text, verses 1 through 13 of chapter 9. We'll pray together and then jump into God's Word. Does that sound good? Well, if it doesn't, that's what we're doing. So I hope it sounds good. (laughs) Verse 1, chapter 9, here's what it says. Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. And as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. And in verse 3, it says, His clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. And then Elijah And Moses, God's word tells us, appeared and began talking with Jesus. And Peter, he exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't know really what else to say, for they were all terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved Son, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. And as they, as they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man, speaking of himself, had risen from the dead. So verse 10 tells us they kept it to themselves. But they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. And then they asked him, why did the teachers of the religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? And Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they chose to abuse him, just as the scriptures predicted. Father, very simply this morning as we open your word, would you open and attune our hearts to the voice of your spirit? Lord, as we've read from your word and and heard in our time of worship this morning, Lord, it's by your Holy Spirit that you bring great illumination to our hearts of who you are. So God, I would ask in these next few moments in your word that you would reveal to us who your son is. Lord, that we would see him more accurately and that our lives would be transformed through a living, vibrant, day-to-day, moment-by-moment relationship with him. Lord, would you give me the ability just to serve your people well, as we spend time in your word. And Lord, I ask and pray that these men and women, that they would lean into your word this morning. I believe you want to speak to us. So I pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1, Mark tells us, Jesus went on to say, meaning what's happening today 
in our text has everything to do with the conversation that Jesus, well, that he has been having and what's been happening. So then that just simply begs the question, well, if he's continuing on to say, well, what's been happening? What's he been saying? And maybe you remember this from last Sunday with our time in Mark chapter 8, that Jesus at that point, I believe Pastor John mentioned it, it's like a hinge point in the gospel of Mark. Everything really begins to open up in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus gives intensely radical, clear teaching on who he is. And catch this, what it means for you and I today. Let me share with you. I'll put it up on the screen. Verse 34 of chapter 8. Here's what Jesus has to say. He says, if any of you wants to be my follower, find me on all the various social... No, he says, you must give up your own way. If anyone wants to follow me, there's this surrender that happens. You give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. Boy, boy, the cross is a sanitary thing in the 21st century. Don't we, some of us, have it in gold or silver around our neck or in tile behind us on stage? Not when they heard this. Take up your cross, the Roman instrument of suffering and humiliation and death for those who deserve it. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, verse 35, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, then you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your old soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. See, Jesus, he's just a good teacher. He didn't believe that he was the son of God or had any kind of authority, right? Doesn't that, isn't that what that shows us? The resounding answer rhymes with go, but it starts with an N. What, what do you think? Yeah. No. If anyone wants to be my follower, you've got to die. Give up your own way. I'm coming back in the glory of my Father and my holy angels. The teaching of who Jesus is, dear friends, is getting crystal clear in the Gospel of Mark. And here's what Jesus is saying. Life lived to the fullest. Life lived as it's intended, as you're created to experience where there's vitality and wholeness and fruitfulness is only found in a life lived for him. Dying to yourself. And it's not just a one-time thing, but it's where he becomes center of your life. You know, it's like Jesus is saying this. You will never live until you walk down death row with me. That's when life is found. A surrendered lifestyle. And then we, we step into chapter 9 this morning, and, and Jesus makes this powerful statement. Look at what he says in verse 9. I, I, chapter 9, verse 1, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Man, if that doesn't set you on your toes, if, that, if you can't set yourself in the scene in that first century as the disciples are hearing Jesus very clearly tell them who he is, and now he says, listen, there's some that are breathing right now. You're going to see this. Don't you think that'd cause you to wake up in church? Like, wow, okay. What does that mean? You know, it's interesting. Mark gets very specific in the next verse. Look at verse 2. He says... Six days later. Six days later, Peter, James, and John, Jesus takes them, and he led them up to a high mountain to be alone. What we're about to read, this is what Mark's doing. He's anchoring this in reality. It's not an imagined fairy tale. It's not a, a once upon a time, Peter, James, and John go up the mountain. With, no. Six days later. See, here are those that Jesus is referencing in verse 1, those that would have been standing there who are going to see the kingdom of God arrive in great power, he's referring to these three who six days later, Jesus takes to a high mountain 
uh, mountain, most likely about 12 miles away, Mount Hermon. It's, it's just the four of them, and they're about to see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Look at verse 2. It says, as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. His clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Church, this isn't fairy tale. Once upon, no. This isn't something that was experienced in like a dreamlike state, or a state of mind or a vision. It was six days later that Jesus fulfills this radical statement that there are some standing here who are going to see something spectacular. The kingdom of God arrive in great power. Well, what happens? His clothes become dazzling white. Something that nothing on this side of eternity could have produced. And if we're not thoughtful and intentional about grasping what Mark is saying, well, we might think it was something like this, right? Like just a bright light shone, oh, from heaven. And he's washed out. Well, in black, he really looks like he's shining forth, huh? Like that, that's not what's happening there, right? The, the bright light is not just shining upon Jesus. It, it wasn't a light just coming from the outside, but Jesus' appearance changes. The New Living Translation says he was transformed. The New King James says he was transfigured. I love how Warren Wearsby says this. He says, the word transfigured describes a change on the outside that comes from the inside. It's the opposite of a masquerade. It wasn't like a light came upon him. It wasn't an outward change that doesn't come from within. You know, I don't know if there's... Well, they are. They're still putting out these movies. Transformers. I'm not even 100% sure that this is the most recent release of this franchise. I mean, I remember the 80s and the toys, right? Anyone from the 80s remember those? Okay. Or even the early 2000s when the old yellow Camaro transforms into Bumblebee, right? Well, in a way, this is what Mark is communicating. Say, so what do you mean? It was a complete change. This revealed who Jesus was. The word that, that Mark uses here is metamorphosis, a, a change from within. Not merely a change in appearance, but a complete change into another form. One author wrote this. He said, on earth, Jesus appeared as a man. But at the transfiguration, Jesus' body was transformed into the glorious radiance that he had before coming to earth. If you know your Bibles, maybe you're thinking of the Gospel of John or the book of Philippians and how those authors describe that. And for those of us that just went through the book of Revelation, <coughs> reveals to us what he'll look like in his glory. See, the glory shone out from him and his clothes became dazzling white and that white was not of this earth. It was a white that no human had seen. See, here's what's happening. This moment on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, Jesus is showing, he's revealing a brief glimpse of who he truly is. Who is he? He's Bumblebee. Does that make sense? Do you get that illustration? Like, that's who Jesus is. He, he's radiant in his glory. This is who he truly is. Pastor David Guzik puts it this way. He says, this wasn't a new miracle, but a temporary pause of the ongoing miracle. I say, what do you mean by that? The real miracle was that Jesus, most of the time, could keep from displaying his glory. So I think many people come into the, the text of the Gospels and say, well, Jesus, he was this Jewish carpenter born to this couple, just an average guy. That's not who Jesus is. Jesus is, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, the Word becoming flesh. That's who Jesus is. And this moment on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, you're seeing Jesus for who he truly is, radiant in glory and power. It's God showing us who his Son is. See, everything that Jesus has said and done up to this point, it's like God is affirming him. 
It's like what one author said, the transfiguration clearly revealed not only what the disciples were correct in believing Jesus to be the Messiah, but that their commitment was well placed in him as, as their eternity was secure. Jesus truly was the Messiah, the divine Son of God. It's no mistake, it's not by happenstance, believe it or not, that chapter 9 comes after chapter 8. And in chapter 8, Jesus asks his disciples, hey, who do the... Who do people say that I am? Some say this, some say that. What do you, who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah. Chapter 9, ding, there's the affirmation. Jesus reveals, transfigures, transformed into who he truly is. And it gets even more powerful. Look who shows up to the party in verse 4. Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Elijah and Moses, two Old Testament celebrities there on the mountain with Jesus. What is this about? It's not your typical Sunday afternoon, Saturday afternoon hike with Jesus on a mountaintop. He's completely transformed. And now two of the biggest names in Jewish history from the past, from the past, are there with him catching up, having a conversation. What are they talking about? We're not told, but here's what we learn from their presence with Jesus. Both of these men, who were and are considered two of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, Moses, he was a representation for the people of the Old Covenant, the law. He was the guy that God used to write the first five books of the law. He was a patriarch of the Jewish people. God used Moses to deliver God's people out of bondage and slavery. And he also spoke of a prophet that would one day come who was more than he was. Elijah, gosh, have you ever thumbed through the Old Testament? There's more than one prophet mentioned. But they're all over the place. And Elijah represents the prophets, men who not only, just like Moses, who were revered, seen in a very positive light, but those who also foretold of one coming. So why are they on the mountain? Remember what Jesus said in verse 1, the kingdom of God will arrive in great power. Moses and Elijah's presence, they, they validate, they confirm, they evidence, they, they provide proof of who Jesus is. It's like one author wrote, their appearance removed any thought that Jesus was a reincarnation. He was not merely one of the prophets, but as God's only son, he far surpassed them in authority and power and their ability to talk with Jesus. I love this. It supports the idea and the promise of the resurrection of all believers. See, Mo and Eli's presence there, they indicate this in the kingdom of God. Jesus has told his disciples, listen, there's, there's men among us here that are going to see the, 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 the power of God, the authority of the kingdom arrive in great power. Well, Number one, this shows us evidence, proof of life beyond this life. Moses at this point would have passed 1,400 years before. Elijah some 900 years before. And there they are in glory with Jesus. And I love this. I was taking two of my kids to wind shape this week. And one of them was asking, Dad, how old will we be in heaven? So a good question. You know, it's interesting. I don't know how old we'll be, but I do know that we won't know less in heaven than we do on earth. I mean, believe it or not, Moses and Elijah, they didn't have Instagram accounts that people follow. They didn't have daily you know, feeds that people would have known. Oh, that's Mo, that's Eli. But when Pete, James, and John are there on the mountain and they saw them with Jesus, they knew who they were. And also these men rep represent to us that Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the law. Isn't this what Jesus said in John chapter 9? You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but the scriptures, they're all about me. Th think about when Jesus arose and he's on that road. And Luke chapter 24 tells us that Jesus was with these guys. And it says in Luke 24, 27, 
one of the best Bible studies you could have ever been a part of, that Jesus took these guys through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Jesus on this mountain is completely transformed, showing who he truly is. The biggest names in the Jewish game are there with him. And these three men, they, they, they see Jesus revealed in authority, in holiness, in power. The biggest names in the Jewish religion are there with him, talking to him. And let me ask you a question. Are there any of those among us who may often feel a bit awkward in a social setting? Don't know what to say or how to respond. Well, this moment is the apex of that experience. Look at verse 5. Mark records for us that Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's, uh, let's do something. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Why did he say this? Well, Mark tells us because he didn't know what to say, right? He's terrified. You know, there's a proverb that if you don't get anything out of this sermon, here's a great proverb to take away today. Proverbs chapter 17. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent. With their mouths shut, they seem intelligent. Or like Abraham Lincoln would say, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. And all, <laughs> all the wives say what? Amen, right? Yeah. <laughs> Peter didn't know what to say. He, James, and John, they're terrified. I mean, wouldn't you have been terrified? Jesus is one that they have seen these miracles perform. Jesus walking on water, breaking bread. But still, when you saw Jesus, he still looked like, talked like, sounded like you. You go on the mountain with Jesus. And if you know the, the time frame of when this is happening, probably two and a half years into the time that Pete, James, and John had been with Jesus, and all of a sudden... It's like that miracle that's been in place just to kind of veil who he really is is lifted for a moment, and they see him glowing from the inside out. He's changed. Pete doesn't know what to say. So what does he say? Hey, it's good that we're here. We, we, should, uh, we should set up a campsite. <laughs> we should pitch some tents. Why does he say that? You know, it's interesting. Chronologists who look at the flow of the New Testament believe that what's happening right here in Mark chapter 9 takes place about six months before the crucifixion. And at the crucifixion, the Jewish holiday that would have been celebrated is the, the Feast of Passover, right? Communion, like we'll celebrate this morning when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. He was taking the Passover meal. And most of those who kind of provide a chronology of the New Testament would say what's happening here on this mount is maybe about six months before. So where does that place it? Well, Jewish people would have been celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles right when this would have gone on. And well, what is that? That's when God's people, they actually stayed in tents or shelters during this festival as a way to look back and remember the time that God provided for them in the wilderness when they left Egypt. And it was also a way to look forward to the future kingdom of, of peace, the age of peace, and the tabernacles. They, they celebrated what God did and anticipated what God would do. So it's like that time of year. And Peter says, you guys are here, all three. Let, let's celebrate this. What he's witnessing is glorious. Jesus for who he truly is. And maybe Pete, maybe he just wants that experience to linger, to stay I mean, Jesus has been talking about dying to self, the cross, but now here on the mountaintop, Elijah, Moses, Jesus. But Peter's missing the point. Jesus is not just a rabbi, right? If I can say this, he's, he's Bumblebee, right? Like That's who he is. He's not on the same level with Moses and Elijah that they should all three get memorials. Jesus is... Well, look, let's let God speak for him. Look at verse 7. A cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen 
to him. And suddenly they looked around and Moses and Elijah were gone and they saw only Jesus with them. I mean, doesn't this kind of evoke the presence of the old, in the Old Testament? God leading his people in that time of Moses with the cloud by day. The voice. Remember Jesus' baptism. Confirmation of who Jesus is. And this word that God uses, saying, listen to him. He's saying, listen and obey him. This is my beloved son. Pay attention to him and do what he tells you. One author said, suddenly the three disciples found themselves alone with Jesus. Elijah and Moses had faded away. The imagery seems to say that Jesus fulfills everything to which the law and the prophets pointed. They will fade away, leaving only him as the path to God. He is so much more than equal to Moses and Elijah. Amen. And it's like, it's like Pete got this one day. I say, what do you mean? Like he fully understood, not in that moment, but he understood as he writes to the early church in 2 Peter about this experience. He says, we're not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice of the majestic glory of God said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. And after this amazing encounter, verse 9 and 10 tells us what happens next, that they, they go back down the mountain. And Jesus tells them not to tell anyone what had happened until they see the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So Mark tells us they, they kept it to themselves, but they, they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. You know, we're told, specifically in the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus shared with his disciples three separate times that he would die and come back to life. At this point, they don't see the whole picture. I mean, how could they? They, they, they wonder, what does this mean? Jesus rising from the dead. And, and other questions linger, Mark tells us in verse 11. It says they ask, why do the teachers of the religious law insist that Elijah, Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? You know, I've got to be honest with you. When I, when I read this this week, I thought, this is the question they have? They've just seen Jesus be revealed for who he truly is. Elijah and Moses are there with Jesus they don't know what to make of all this. Questions linger. And one of the questions that's at the front of the line in their mind, hey, why did teachers tell us that Elijah should come first? I mean, I get it on some level. They just saw Elijah, but, but why do they ask this? Well, consider this with me. Moses and Elijah are there on this momentous moment on the mountain. Jesus is talking about resurrection from the dead. And there has been this crucial, pivotal realization and recognition of who Jesus is in Mark 8. Oh, he's the Messiah. And all of this sets the stage, creates the sense for the disciples to recognize the end is near. And it prompts this question. Why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? The teachers of the day believed Elijah must, according to Malachi's prophecy. So Jesus turns that question around and he says this. Elijah is indeed coming first in verse 12 to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? Jesus makes this connection. He says the same scriptures that predict Elijah's coming also predict a suffering Messiah. I mean, Psalm 16, 22, 110, Isaiah 52. It's like when you open up Genesis 3, 15 and this mention of the gospel. It all unfolds that the Son of Man will suffer and be treated with contempt and be killed and rise from the dead. So it's like Jesus says in verse 13, I tell you, Elijah, 
He's already come. And they chose to abuse him just as the scriptures predicted. Hmm. You know, in Matthew's gospel, we're given a, a parallel account telling of this conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. And it's clear in Matthew that, that Jesus says that John the Baptist, he came in the spirit of Elijah. Same kind of prophetic role. Boldly confronting sin, pointing people to God, and they rejected him and killed him. And here's the reality. He says, they'll do the same to me. And today, as we close this morning, we'll, we'll remember that together as we take communion. And this morning, we're going to give kind of time and focus in our Sunday morning gathering to remembering who Jesus is through what he's called us to do to remember him, to remember his blood, to remember his body. But, uh, but I don't want us to leave this time in God's word without considering all that we learn about who Jesus is and how our lives can and should look in light of what the text tells us this morning. See, the question comes, why did God come, so to speak, incognito? <clears throat> Moment oh, excuse me, let me just grab a little bit of water. <clears throat> the question comes, why did God come incognito momentarily and yet here on this mountain reveal to us unmistakably who he is. Remember the top tens of the old late night shows? Let me share you it, with you if I could the top ten things that this section of scripture teaches to us this morning. Number one, this mount of transfiguration reveals very clearly to us who Jesus is, that he's God. Number two, it strengthened Jesus as he began his way to the cross. Jesus is on the way to the cross here in Mark chapter 9. And just as he began his ministry at the baptism with John the Baptist, and that voice from heaven confirmed who he is, so too here on this mountain, his father confirms his love for his son. And the disciples, number three, this kind of fortified in their minds who he is to obey him. Jesus had just revealed this dynamic of who he truly is. He's the Messiah. And this calling to die in order to experience life with him. And now they see him on this mountain. But also it demonstrates that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets as God's final and complete revelation. It's a confirmation of Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah. It teaches that the Messiah who was crucified is the same Messiah who will reign over his kingdom. It encourages this disciples in light of Jesus' prediction of his death and resurrection. It refills the promise of Mark chapter 9, verse 1, that there were some standing there who were going to see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. It reaffirmed. God's love for his son, and it calls us, and this is the point I want to linger upon as we close, calls us to trust and follow the one, the only son who is the image of the invisible, the radiance of God's glory. You see, it's in Jesus and Jesus alone we can behold the glory and the greatness of God and live. There's an old quote from an old British preacher who said, the Son of God became man, that the children of men might become the children of God. And on this mountain, with his disciples, Jesus reveals who he truly is. Great glory and radiance on that mountain. This transformation that would have happened before his disciples shows to them that he is the one with complete authority, complete power, complete control, complete sovereignty. And I think the reality is this. You can trust him. Lainey Louise Pearl is two years old. Red hair, curly, blue eyes, feisty, 
and fearless, it seems, when she's around her siblings and her parents. She seems to know that as the, the youngest of six, that she can get away with anything. That seems to be her mindset around our home, that she can climb up on our little ottoman that sits right in front of our couch and just jump off and say, catch me. And she knows that out of these seven other humans in the home and maybe the dog, Ollie, she's going to be okay. She's got this sense because of who she is and the placement of her, I guess, the order of our kids and all these siblings around her and her mom and her dad, that she's safe and that she's secure. Why do I share this? She sees her parents and her kid and our kids, they're her siblings, for who they are. Hey, these guys love me. I can tell after two years of being with them. They're pretty much do whatever I tell them to do. <laughs> She's a child. You know, Jesus mentioned elsewhere in the Gospels that unless we become like little children, we'll never experience the relationship with God that we're intended to have. Why, why do I share this? You know, as a pastor, I get this unique insight and line of sight into the lives of so many people within our congregation. Every single week, we hear about things that are worthy of celebration, that are good, that we see God provide in ways in people's lives where, man, look at how God just provided exactly what that couple, that family, that individual needed right at the right time. And also, we hear of so many areas of need. Areas where we go, God, unless you intervene in this marriage, unless you intervene in this health dynamic, you're the only answer. You're the only one that can do something that no other person can do. Unless you intervene. You see, Lainey Louise Pearl trusts us because she knows us. And we're not revealed in great power. Our, our clothes don't shine brightly than any other bleach on this side of eternity could make white. But she sees us as strong. She sees us as capable. She sees us as caring. She sees us as someone who's worthy of her trust. And so she'll just jump off that ottoman. God, my, my mom and dad, they got me. And as a pastor, we get this opportunity each week to receive prayer requests, to do times in hospital visitation, to, to sit down with couples in the life of our church and hear about either how God's moving and blessing or how there's opportunity for trust in a God who's worthy and capable of our trust. And I think the point of this text in, the, in Mark chapter 9, the transfiguration of Jesus, as we spend some time this morning responding in communion in worship, here's the takeaway I want us to, to walk out of this room with together this morning. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're encountering, I need you to own this simple truth. God is good and God is able. And I can trust him. I can trust him. This transfiguration moment with Jesus and his disciples, he's being revealed for who he is. He's not just a, a peasant rabbi who, who's giving out teachings and, and leading and providing these in individuals with food when they need it or, or performing these miracles that are unexplainable. No, he's God. God who came incognito, as one author would say, who on this mountain is revealed for who he truly is, radiant. He's the one that stands above all. He's center and supreme. When Pete said, hey, it's good that we're here. We should make tents for all three of you. God says, no, 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 no. This is my son. Listen to him. He's the one life is all about. And life comes to the fullest when you begin to walk down death row with Jesus and say, Lord, I surrender all to you. Like a child, I trust you. I know you've got me. I can walk through the highs. I can walk through the lows knowing who you are. God, you've revealed your glory. You're good and you're faithful and you're mighty and you're powerful. I can trust you. And I just want to encourage you this morning as we close in communion, not allow this time to be lost on you 
on the reality that God loves you so very much that he gave his best for you, his son. And who is his son? His son is the one that was transfigured there, transformed. He has all authority and power and glory and might. And he's paved a way for you and I through his death and resurrection to have a living, vibrant, real relationship with him. And so I just want to encourage you this morning. I want to call you this morning, if I can, to a fresh place of surrender and trust in him. He's the one who's worthy. He's the one who has authority. He's the one who has power. And so this morning as we sing, as we take communion, I would just encourage you, cast all your cares upon him. Trust him with the needs that you have in your life and recognize that he's good and that he's able and he's worthy of our trust. Mark chapter 9 reveals unto us who he is. He's that Messiah who's worthy of every ounce of my trust. The disciples had just heard Jesus speak this powerfully clear message of who he is. And on that mountain, they see him revealed truly as he is in authority and power. And if I can have your attention in these last few moments together, that's who he is today. He is seated on the throne. The angels around him say, holy, holy, holy. He is working out his plan. He is resurrected. And he says this great thing at the end of the gospel's account, to go therefore and make disciples, teaching those that know and come to him to follow all the things that he taught, to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to recognize that he's with us even till the end of the age. Church, life is about living for him. And as we do that, trusting him, knowing that he's good and that he's able, and we see him for who he truly is, in authority and in power. And this morning, as we come to take communion, Surrender your cares. Surrender your burdens. Celebrate together who he is, the resurrected one who has all authority and all power.